Good morning, and welcome to Lafayette Presbyterian Church on this, the Lord's Day. We are glad that you are here, and you picked a good day to come because we're going to have lunch afterwards, which is what I got a few of you here for. Some of you heard free food and showed up. It was great. So we are looking forward to that as we celebrate Sydney's graduation, and uh, I'm glad that we can gather together in, in person uh, once again. We did come in on two wheels, maybe one this morning. There is a train bound for glory. It is not the one right outside of Villa now. That one is stopped. It's going nowhere. Uh, so we turned around, went a different direction. I saw some different parts of the country, some different parts of this beautiful land. I didn't see them for very long, mind you, but I saw them, and Brittany held on, and she's already had her own worship service in the back seat as we move forward. <laughs> Um, but but we, are, we are glad that you are here with us today. Uh, go ahead and give a few words of instruction uh, just in uh, preparation for the celebration of the Lord's Supper later uh, during worship. During worship, for those who are comfortable coming forward, that's all right, Sydney. For those of us who are comfortable coming forward, uh, we will come down that aisle receive the elements by a small cracker, the cup, and then we have a pristine Tupperware jar there as you go past uh, to dispose of your cup as you head back to the pews. For those who would rather stay in the pew to receive communion, in the back uh, there are individual communion elements there that you can get and uh, celebrate together that way. So I wanted to make you aware of both of things as we head for worship. Finally, the place we're having lunch is within walking distance. I think Richard's going to be the line leader and maybe Ray at the end, or I, I don't know. We'll figure it out, but, but we are within walking distance from lunch afterwards, so we look forward and hope everyone will join us for that. Are there other announcements or prayer concerns to be shared among God's people this day? And for those of you on the internet who haven't heard a word I've said at this point because I didn't turn on my microphone, you haven't missed anything really yet. We're just glad that you are here. Let us now turn our hearts and minds to worshiping God. Please join me in the call to worship. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. I can see him in your face. Please stand as you are able and join us in our opening hymn, what? hymn number 142, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. I got it on.
seated. The chaos of our world confuses us and leads us astray. Let us return to the clarity God can provide through our prayer of confession. Please join us, join me in the unison prayer of confession. Eternal God, we dissociate from parts of your creation and falsely separate and to clean and unclean. You call us to love one another and make more space at your table of belonging. Forgive our exclusion and judgment. Cleanse us of the sin that distorts your truth. Please continue. Amen. Hear now the assurance of pardon. We are a part of God's transformed creation. God is among us, making all things new. Claim this grace. Know God's forgiveness. Rise with Christ to a life made new. Amen. My friends, the peace of Christ be with you. Let us pass the peace to one another, and we're still kind of waving in this. Let us join together with the statement of faith in the time of uncertainty, found in your bulletins. This is the good news in which we stand, and by which we are saved, if we hold it fast, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter. Oh, and then many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Most gracious God, as we continue to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, we pray that we may be bound together in Christian love by our faith and fellowship that will lift your spirit for others to share. We humbly thank you for your many blessings you have given us. We ask that we may learn how to truly be Easter and always remember that we are celebrating resurrection. We pray for you every day. First scripture is from the Gospel of John. Chapter 13, verses 30, 13, verses 31 through 35. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified. God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself 
Lord, I him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, who have love for one another. The second scripture is from the book of Revelation. Chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away in the sea no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. This is the word of the Lord. Before I begin my sermon, I... I Remember something sitting up here. When I was a, a kid, when we would go home from church, brother and sister would often rate the sermon and share that information with my dad who was driving us home, whether it was a, a one or a ten. I'm now sitting up here, and he may do the same. And what I want you to know, Dad, is I always graded you much higher than my brother and sister did. I appreciate it. Thank you. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts might be full in your sight. You who are our very strong. Have you but looking back on it, you realized it was probably maybe a B-rate movie at best. It's happened to me on a and one time that I recalled recently as, as we've been thinking about kids and their graduation a long time ago. Somehow, it's my turn, and I was rocking a I think it was Sydney. Brittany immediately came home and started sleeping through the night. She hasn't missed much sleep. Or, or, or to be rocked, and... And, and, and so I got up, and I, I went in there with the recliner, and, and I turned on for a while. And as I rocked the remote control, it fell in between the And I couldn't read it. Whatever was on TV, I was going to be man, but I remember those famous words from, from the Jim Croce song, or you, you remember him, or, or some of you do. You know, he, he says you don't tug on Superman's cape, and you don't spit into the wind, you don't tug the mask off old Lone Ranger, and you don't wake up sleeping babies at 2 a.m. 
I, I, I think that's how the song goes. Anyway, I, I got engrossed in the movie, and, and to this day, I don't know what it was, but, but it was set in the 1920s or 30s. It had the setting and the feel of the Walton. You, you Tom Boy and Aaron and, and, and Jim Bob, Grandpa. No. Anyway, this was one of those old coming-of-age movies. And one scene I remember before that sleep, he writes, a young man, a, a little old, between childhood and, and young adulthood, and, and it was the dawning of a new day, a long expected day. was the roaring man was on his way the old Dickens novel great expect say to get rural Appalachian he was destined for great things in New York or Chicago anyway the, the young man and a half he, he, he had University. Big news. Not of oatmeal. If it had been authentic, it had been grits. But but. It that clattering Model T to the railway. It wasn't long before the locomotive appeared and the steam. Still, no one said much of anything, but, but the conductor yelled, All aboard! The young man kissed his mother on the cheek, gave his father a perfunctory hug, and he bound up the steps. He seated himself beside a window where he could look out. The little town and his parents, the camera. The camera angle made it look as if all that was so small out in the distance. And then the train began to head down the tracks, lurching forward and then picking up speed. His mother suddenly began to run, to run along the platform. She kept up with the train for just a little bit, and the young man rolled down that window and and stuck his head out. It was then that his mother cupped hands to mouth and called out four words that would be etched in his memory for the rest of his life. She said, remember who you are. Remember who you are. Words of advice any mother would gladly give a son or daughter leaving home for the first time. The lessons are over. The chores have ended. The arm of parental discipline, it's gone as far as it can. From here on, the discipline of that young person must come from within. No longer is it a matter of, of direction and correction. Now it's a matter of character. It's a scary moment for the child and the parent. 
but it's one that's been repeated again and again for, for generations across families. But this call of remembering who you are, it, it's not new. In fact, it's essential to the Judeo-Christian tradition. For, for example, the Passover. The Passover, which Jesus celebrated every year as a good Jew, with its highlight being the Seder meal, which scholars believe is where the, the first sacrament of the Lord's Supper occurred. That, that meal is a 15-step meal. We, we're not having 15 courses today, are we? No, no, it, it, it's a 15-step meal. It's family-oriented with tradition and, and rituals, which is meant to remind the Jewish community of who they are. And this call to remember occurs again and again in and out of Scripture. As I thought about that, even Disney, you, you know my family, we're, we're, we're Disney nuts. Even Disney has capitalized on it. Again, in my remembering my children, I remember there was a point in time where we had one videotape. You, you remember videotapes, right? You used to have to put them in a VCR and the clock always blinked 12. Anyway, we had one videotape they wanted to watch again and again and again and again and again. It was the Lion King. You remember the Lion King, right? Well, one of the most pivotal parts in that, in that story is when Simba, Simba the young lion who has run away from home after the death of his father, is asked to return and gain his rightful heir to the throne and the king of the pride lands. He, he's given a vision from the stars, and in that vision, he is told to remember who he is. And in essence, Jesus today, in some of the very last words to his disciples, is telling them to remember who they are. It's already happened at the Lord's Supper. Jesus has already taken a towel and a basin and washed his disciples' feet, an example of the lifestyle he means for them to follow. He's already announced that one will betray him, and now Jesus turns to the eleven who remain. He says he will stay with them only a little longer. Where he's going, no one can follow and he offers to them a new commandment, sort of a going away present. Love one another, he tells them. That's all. As simple as that, by this everyone will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Remember who you are. In other words, remember that you are different from everyone else. Remember that you, my followers, are the ones who are called to love. So the call of the Christian life is fairly simple. It's a call to love. I said it was simple. I didn't say it was easy. Because it's easy to say, but it's hard to do. Sure, we answer, Jesus, we get it. And in an ideal world, we love one another, but this world is anything but ideal. Loving family is tough enough. Now, now, now not mine. There are a lot of my family here. Loving y'all is, is always easy. But I hear that there are some families where, where sometimes there are disagreements that can occur. And we struggle to love one another. And if we struggle to love family, how are we supposed to love everyone else? Now, now this struggle with loving family, it, 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 it's not all that new. You remember Adam and Eve? Everything was going along good in paradise until they eat that forbidden fruit. Eve gives it to Adam, and, and Adam eats it, and, and God is angry. So what does Adam do? Well, he does what any good husband does. He blames it on his wife. It's the first marriage. And there in all of history, 
And it's also the first marital conflict. It didn't take long, did it? It doesn't get much better for Adam and Eve after the children come along. It's the very offspring, the first in all of human history. It's also the first murder and the first act of domestic violence, brother against brother. In fifth grade, in fifth grade, I had the meanest Sunday school teacher in the history of humanity. It was my dad's first church. I am certain she taught Sunday school to King David. She threatened to, and honestly, I believe, wanted to fail each and every one of us from fifth grade Sunday school and make us repeat it again. One of our main failings involved the greater and the shorter catechism. It seemed that none of us had learned it word for word. It was disappointing to her because I think she helped write it. She was especially upset that the preacher's kid had not learned it. Now in this class with me was a, a couple of, of other students from a very large family, the Harrington family. Not only did they have their own large kids, they, they fostered numerous kids. At one time, they had over 30 children living in their home. Miss Florence Quinn, the, the taskmaster Sunday school teacher, on one particular Sunday, had come in early and written in beautiful chalk on the chalkboard. Honor thy father and thy mother. Command number five. She then asked us children sitting there, is there a commandment that teaches us how to love our brothers and sisters? Sure there is, said Slim Harrington. I'll never forget this. Sure there is, said Slim. It's simple. Thou shalt not kill. There's something about family that brings out both the best and the worst in us. So how is it that we are to love? How can we beat the odds that seem to do marriages and relationships and, and bring about conflict and jealousy? There's a clue right here in this morning's scripture. Just as I have loved you, says Jesus, you should love one another. These words remind us that we are not alone in our loving. Remember where love comes from. It doesn't originate with us. It isn't something we conjure up in the laboratories of our lives. No, it's a gift that comes from God. Love is born of God. Love is a gift. In fact, according to Paul, the greatest gift from God the Reverend Dr. George Butcherick is a Presbyterian pastor. He was professor of homiletics and a gifted author. He once said this about the golden rule. He said, it is blind without Christ and Christ's love. It is burdensome without Christ in Christ's love. Yes, the golden rule is indeed the golden rule, but it's only because of Christ and his love and it being he that spoke it. So love originates with God, but it doesn't mean we don't have to work in it. On the contrary, love requires a great deal of work. One of the most enduring and destructive myths of our modern culture is the belief that true love happens automatically, that it requires very little of us except to place ourselves in its path. That sort of love is weak in, indeed. Compare it to the active, even aggressive love demonstrated by Annie Sullivan. Do you, do you remember Annie Sullivan? She was that special education teacher who glimpsed within a blind, deaf, mute girl named Helen Keller extraordinary potential. 
with a stubborn determination. Annie struggled with that isolated, locked away human spirit. There was no language that she could use to communicate with Helen at first, so Annie invented a language. She was kicked, bruised, spat upon. She went to bed bone tired many evenings, simply from things like trying to convince Helen to sit at a table and eat with a knife and a fork. Yet Annie's love didn't let her give up. Finally, she was able to teach Helen Keller a system of hand signals through which she could assign everything a name. Then came the day when Helen Keller climbed up into her teacher's lap and tapped out a simple message. I love you. Did Helen Keller know love before she received it from Annie Sullivan? Probably not. Yet because Annie was persistent in loving her pupil, even without love being reciprocated, one day it was. Helen Kellen loved Annie Sullivan because Annie Sullivan loved her first. So too we love because God loves us first. Far from being automatic, Christian love is a daily choice in your spousal and partner, partner relationships, in your friendships, your family relationships, in your work relationships, even in your school relationships. Each of us must decide each day, sometimes each hour or, or even minute by minute, that we're going to continue to love the other person. It's sort of like a, a three-legged race. At Georgia Tech this spring, we've been to a lot of baseball and softball games. It's, it's been beautiful weather. Last year, there were a lot of rainouts. This year, it, it, it's been beautiful. They always try to come up with activities to do between innings to keep the fans engaged. And, and they almost always have a three-legged race. Oh, it's great to get a bunch of college students out there you know, in their 19s and 20s and, and tape them up leg to leg together and see them run down the, 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 the third baseline to see who the winner is. You know, they, they put one leg to the other and, and off they go. They're facing the same direction. They see the finish line at the end and somebody yells go and then suddenly they're off and falling pretty quickly most of the time. You see, to succeed in the three-legged race, each partner needs to match the other movements of the other person. The two of them are bound together, whether they want to be or not, in a relationship. There's no escaping it. Yet, unless the two freely choose to proceed in a synchronized relationship, they're not going to get very far. Each step requires concentration. It's a conscious choice, one step after the other. Just trying to do what comes naturally and walking your own pace isn't going to work. You'll end up on the ground a tangled heap. Many of you don't know this, but, but we started in our bulletin that statement of faith in a time of uncertainty. And we've been reading it since the, the terrible war in the Ukraine has started. I've been keeping up a little bit with the Ukrainian war. I don't want it to become something that we just remember as part of, of the back burner as we move on to the next news cycle story. And I came across a story recently. Now, now wars, if you catch them on the news or you read them in the history book, there are, there are a lot of statistics and numbers, they, they know tactics and movements and name places. But the truth about wars are this. Behind every statistic and every number is a person and a story. I came across one of those out of one of the southern Ukrainian cities that a reporter, reporter gave. The reporter was covering the devastation in the town, and he saw a little girl. A little girl shot by a sniper in the crossfire. He threw down his pad and his pencil and stopped being a reporter 
for just a few minutes. He rushed over to a man who was holding the child, and he said, come with me, my car's right here, and he helped them both into his car. The reporter got in front, and he stepped on the accelerator, racing to the hospital. The man holding the bleeding child said to him, hurry, my friend, my child is still alive. A few moments later, he said, hurry, my friend, my child is still breathing. Then it was this, hurry, my friend, my child is still warm. Finally, as they arrived at the hospital, the man whispered, hurry, hurry, oh God, my child is getting cold. When they reached the hospital, within moments, that little girl was pronounced dead. The two men went over to a sink where they stood in silence, washing the blood from their hands and their clothes as best they could, when that Ukrainian turned to the reporter and said, I have a terrible task before me. I must go and tell that little girl's father that his child is dead. He will be heartbroken. The reporter was amazed. He looked at the grieving man and he said, I thought you said that was your child. He looked back in the man and he said, it's not my daughter. They are all our children. Yes, they are all our children. That's what meant by love's daily choice. If this man could choose to love child of a neighbor, to love and care for her with all the passion of a natural father, then so can, no, so must we. We must choose to love others in the same way. And folks, as the church, we, as the people of God, it's what we are built for. It takes intentionality and in remembering who we are both in life and in death. It means leaning on the promises we have been given that even on those hard days, and there are hard days, even in spite of the noise that tries to rob us of remembering, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, in fact, God's own people. In the passage we read from Revelation today, John reminds the church who is being persecuted by the emperor Nero and is under attack that they are of a chosen race and a royal priesthood and God's own people. And he gives them a glimpse of the promised day of God. We hear that in the promised day of God, God's grace and God's love will wipe away tears from every eye. But I think in that promise, there is also a call that we can miss. Because I believe, if I understand the text, that until that promised day arrives, we, as God's children, are called to wipe away tears from those hurting in this world. Yes, until that promised day is made known and full, wiping away tears and loving others. It's our call. It's our job. And if, if we can wipe tears and love neighbors and see everybody as our own children, then not only will we remember who we are, we'll remember whose we are. And we will be demonstrating the kingdom of God on earth, even as we know it will be in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we believe. Help our unbelief. In Christ. Amen. Friends, having good, heard the good news and the good news proclaimed, let us confess that which we believe using the Apostles' Creed found on the inside cover of your hymnal. As you are able, let us stand and say that which we believe together. Friends, what do you believe?
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, through our offerings, we are invited to put God first in our lives, to show our gratitude and our commitment. We owe everything to God, our lives, our health, people who love us, meaningful work and activities. God dwells among us, making all things new. Let us participate in this new creation by offering our gifts to God. Let us respond to all of this in gratitude.
join me in the unison prayer of dedication found in your bulletin. Let us pray. Grateful for your radical hospitality and steadfast love, we present these gifts to you, God. Use them to further your will and transform our world anew. Redeemed creation. Amen. You may be seated. of the Lord's Supper. And after sharing a meal and washing their feet, he gathered them at the table and he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he said, This is my body, broken for you. Eat. Do this in remembrance of me. In a likewise manner, he took the cup and he had after giving thanks. He said, This in this cup is my blood shed for you. Drink. Do this in remembrance of me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God when you come to the table.
Let us pray. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. On this fourth Sunday of Easter, as the scent of lilies linger and the flowering cross not yet a distant memory, hold your resurrection glory before us as our guide and our hope, O oh God. May this season plant seeds of new life and yield growth and maturity in Christ. May the presence of your spirit be ours this day. In heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
courage. Hold fast.